Okay. Thank you very much and welcome everybody to the Commodore LA Super Show. We're really glad to have you here today. And as uh, people are uh, coming in, I wanted to uh, play off of what uh, David just said in the previous uh, presentation about the all the stories that came out of Commodore. They're not only what was going on behind the scenes, but also some of the stories of the people who started careers and uh, build lives around this computer. And this was something that I had always wanted to write about. I started out my my computer writing career uh, for a Commodore 64 software company called NTech. They had a music program called Studio 64. And so, and I fell in love with this computer because it uh, was, in, this was in 1983 when I bought my first Commodore uh, computer. And it enabled me to do things that I couldn't do before. And I was going to college at the time, so doing my term papers, which were an arduous chore, it was just a challenge to figure out where the bottom of the page is so you had enough room to put in your footnotes. And being able to do all this cut and copy and paste and do all the wonderful things that you can do with the computer. So I started off, like most of you, with the C64. I went on to the Commodore 128, which is where that light is over there. And of course, the natural progression was to the Amiga. I had an Amiga 500 from 87 to 91. We actually did the plans for my wife and our wedding on the Commodore, I mean on the Amiga. So we so made a lot of memories with that. So writing about the Amiga was something that I always wanted to do. And it was also tied in with some of the frustration that we had in the Commodore world when people, the mainstream com uh, computer press, didn't seem to pay any attention to it. You would pick up InfoWorld or you pick up Byte and you would see IBM PC articles for days. Maybe you'll see an occasional Macintosh. But they seem to not consider the Amiga a serious computer. So we'd be missing out on articles, even in article, even in areas like graphics and music where the Amiga excelled in. So like everybody who's what who used the Amiga. I wanted to give our computer its due. And it took me a number of years to write this novel. It, I had a lot of fits and starts. And finally, if, or in 2016, as part of National Novel Writing Month, I finally figured out how to put the story together so I could write about our beloved Amiga. Now, one of my big challenges with this book was I had to relearn everything about the Amiga. I sold my, my Amiga 500 in 1991, and so I had to relearn everything about the Amiga. Like, I had to learn about Workbench, and even how the startup sounds worked. And that's, and I was thinking about buying an Amiga, but they do take up a lot of space, which we didn't really have, and then, there's recapping, and I'm the world's worst software, <laughs> so that was going to be out. But fortunately, I got Amiga or Amiga Forever. That's the Cloanto product, and so I got to be able to start playing with Workbench and the familiar Boing demo, which played a role in my book. So what I wanted to do with Amiga was to recapture what it was like when we first experienced this computer for the first time. 
when we looked at something like this, which for younger people, this is pretty basic and primitive, but how it felt to be, to be part of this revolution. So that's what I did with my novel, Amiga. Now, what the story is about, it's about a young programmer named Laura, who goes to work for the startup Commodore company that actually works out of somebody's living room. And it's about some of the challenges she faced producing a computer product for this computer, and some of the interpersonal challenges with the people she has to work with, including a family with secrets. And it also ties in to her life in 2016 as she's going through various family and career crises. And I wanted to include these stories about 2016 to give what, what would young people think if they were to see this computer from the 1980s? And what type of lessons could they learn from a person's past? So what I want to do is share some readings from the books. And for example, I talked about the Boing Ball demo, which is so iconic that the publisher decided to put that on the cover, or the original cover of the book. But what was it like to see that demo for the first time? And this is the scene that I wrote. I heard the sound before I even stepped into Peter's room. I stepped towards the Amiga. Peter's smile grew as I moved closer. He slid in his chair away. He slid his chair away from the desk. I stepped into the space he vacated. I leaned over and stared at the Amiga screen. This is, this is what happens when you run out of hands. <laughs> a 3D white and red checkered ball bounced against a gray background with a purple grid. With each bounce, the ball spun and cast a shadow against the background. It gave a realistic hollow and echoing boom like a real rubber ball against the wall. I couldn't stop staring at that ball. Ba-boom, 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 ba-boom. You wrote this, I said. No, he replied. It came on a demo disc. Ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. I considered all of the processing power, local memory use, object collision tracking, 3D modeling, and audio synchronization needed to produce this demo. But I couldn't stop watching that ball. It was hypnotic, engrossing. It didn't feel like I was looking at a computer anymore. Boom, 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 boom. I whispered, how did they do this? So this was one of the things I wrote about. I also wanted to show the connection between the technology that we grew up with and the technology that people are using today. So the program that I had these characters worked on, it's sort of a precursor to the Photoshops and the camera apps that we use on our phones today. So I, what I did was I had the, a program that they would connect a video camera. What I chose was the Micron Eye, which was at the time only available for the Apple II and the Commodore 64. And I figured out that they could find a way to wire it, sort of like the way our ham operator did, so they could plug it into the Commodore 64. So it would turn into like a very early version of the camera app. And I wanted to show, and I actually got a hold of the user guide 
for Micron I. It was available online. So I used that as a reference as I was writing this scene. Let me just separate this paper here just a second. And this was the scene that I wrote. I plugged in the RS-232 serial cable into the Amiga and aimed the camera at our first subject, a teacup with a gold rim and pastel painted roses. It seemed like a simple subject. The first thing I drew in Miss Erickson's art class in eighth grade was a coffee mug. But getting the faint roses and rose rim with all the shadows would be a challenge for the device. We knew it would be because the Micron Eye Operator's Manual had a whole appendix about option, about optic selection and lighting. Yes, I did read that whole section. <laughs> Peter finished rebuilding the program. Are we ready? Ready as will ever be. I stepped away from the end of the bench where I set up the camera and teacup. I stood behind Peter as he double-clicked the photo lamp program icon. Every time he opened that icon, we worried that the program would crash. But there was no guru meditation error. The photo lab window opened with a blank white canvas for the photo and our toolbox. Now to activate the camera. Peter right-clicked the mouse to bring up the menus. You remember that from the Amiga? He selected a bunch of commands and clicked on several windows, and then the camera came on. A black and white video image replaced the white canvas. It was a hand reaching for the teacup. Hey, 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 Peter bellowed at a volume I hadn't heard before. I held up my hand to stop him. Maria? She clutched the teacup close to her chest, afraid her trembling hands would drop it. Mrs. Posner said that she was missing one of her teacups. She told me to find it. You can tell her we're using it right now. I reached out my hand. Maria carefully set the teacup in my, her, in my palm. She turned her attention to the device. Is that a camera? Peter fidgeted in his chair. I kept calm and smiled. It is. She stared at it from different angles. How do you take the picture? Peter jumped in. Well, the camera is operated from the libraries in our program, which sends initiation signals through the RS-232 port. And what he's saying, I interjected, is that you take the picture from our program on the computer. Maria then looked at the computer screen. So how do you take the picture? Well, you. I then looked at the computer and the video of the empty edge of the table. How do you take the picture, Peter? It's easy. You first configure the RS-232 interface by pressing Amiga R. R, my eyes widen. R for RS-232. Maria and I both looked at each other in puzzlement. Peter continued undaunted. You then use the initialization command to open the channel to the device. <laughs> Next, you have to set the configuration, such, such as setting the picture size and exposure control. Then you activate the camera to allow the video screen to appear on the canvas. Maria tense, but how do you take the picture? <laughs> I'm getting to that, Peter grumbled. You then have to press Amiga S to open the save window. You then select the destination of the file and enter the file name, including the .iff extension, and then you press save. When you're ready to take the picture, you press Amiga D. <laughs> D, I said. D for download. Oh. <laughs> Peter stared at me like he just told a joke I didn't laugh at. You know, download the image to the disk. <laughs> Maria stepped closer to the screen. What if you just have a button? Oh. <laughs> Peter turned to her. What kind of button? A shutter release button, just like a regular camera. But we can't just put a button on the screen. <laughs> Why not, I said. 
This is a computer. You can't make a computer work like a camera. <laughs> but that's what we're basically doing. Maria has a point. We should make taking pictures with a computer as easy as taking them with a regular camera. But what about the RS-232 port configuration? What about screen resolution and exposure control? Maria spoke calmly. Regular cameras have settings too. They are on the control knobs and lens. You can set them whenever you need to. If you just want to take a picture, you press the button. I turned to Maria and smiled. You know a lot about photography. She took a step back and clutched the collar of her dress. Yes, I do. <laughs> So that's what I wanted to capture was what it was like when we were starting out with personal computers back in the 1980s. And I also wanted to show the connection between the technology that you see in this room today, these computers that, were, that we were just starting to discover what they were capable of doing and how they evolved into the technology that we depend upon today. And that's what I wanted to project in the novel Amiga. Oh. Yeah, there goes the paper. <laughs> so, what I want, it's the feeling that my character Laura expresses in the story when she says that every click was a new discovery. Opening a program was an adventure. The Amiga had moments that made me exclaim, wow, I didn't know a computer can do that. We had no industry standards or rules. We defined them as we went along. We were pioneers in pristine, unexplored wilderness before we paved it over with an information superhighway. The Amiga made me feel that anything was possible because when I was 24, anything was possible. Now, if you're interested in... So if you're interested in the book, uh, first of all, I don't have annual subscriptions. <laughs> but you can buy a... <laughs> Thank you. You can buy a personally autographed copy uh, from me today at the, at the, the event. It's $18 tax is included. And then I have some of my other books. There's. Uh, the remainder is my mm. newest novel. It's mm. also $18 included. And then if you're into public speaking, I have a guidebook called Mastering Tabletop that huh. my beautiful daughter Stephanie is showing off there. Huh. It's $10. All, all, they can all be autographed for you. And then if you want all three, you, there's a, you get it for $36, mm. which is $10 off the price of all three books. And if you're not able to come here to the show, the books are available on Kindle and Kindle Unlimited. So if you're on Kindle Unlimited, you can get those uh, for, you know, as part of your subscription. You can also find them in paperback wherever books are sold. So I want to thank all of you for your time. And I will open it up for questions about the book or about uh, Commodore or Amiga in general, and I'll answer those best I can. Matthew, how would you characterize your book Amiga? Is it a like a fictional remembrance, or what would you say is is the book? Is it is it more toward humor? Is it more toward drama? Uh, tell me uh, more about it. It's, um, Amiga is fiction, it's more towards drama, oh. and the Amiga is sort of a part of the story, and it's something that connects past to present um, for this woman who's trying to use, trying to come to terms with what happened to her back in the 1980s uh, when she was starting out and uh, trying to make a life for herself. And, 
the challenges that she faces today. Thank you. Yes. I was wondering. Um, yes. How uh, you say you used, you used your media in college? Um, did you use uh, your computer skills later on? I mean, in as part of your career, or or how how did you use that later on? Yes. Well, I was a. My, I became. I'm a technical writer. I worked for a software company in Irvine, California, and EdTech was how I got into technical writing because at first they hired me to do public relations, writing press releases as a college uh, internship, and then I wound up writing every anything that had to do with writing which included user manuals, and that became the basis of, the, of my career. And in fact, we did, um, for this one product, Studio 64, you know, desktop publishing became a big, th you know, big thing in the 80s with PageMaker, but we were actually, we actually did an entire user guide on a Commodore 64 using a it was a daisy wheel printer no, with yeah, paper yeah, clip yes. 64 uh, yes. and we actually did bitmap screenshots but we had to cut those out uh, and paste them on uh, 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 paste them for it. but yeah I've been working on computers for 40 years now mm -hmm. and what's interesting and there's so many stories like I remember going to a multimedia event in 1993 and everybody thought well multimedia was going to be CD-ROMs and 3D spinning icons and then Carta was the big thing mm -hmm. and so I was looking at those things and then somebody said hey you might want to check out this little room in the back and they were playing with something called the World Wide Web <laughs> and it didn't look like much compared to all the really spinning icons and little movie clips. They were still using like maybe HTML 1.1 or something like that. Mm -hmm. But they were talking about, you know, you can change this document on the and download it and up update the server and then everybody else gets the same information. Mm -hmm. So it was neat to be, a, to watch this technology being born, of course, it would have been either even neater if I invested in some of those companies. <laughs> that would be, uh, yeah. Yeah, where would we all be? Exactly. Yeah. I have my website. I started my own website before Google was started, so I'm, oh, wow. mine was started in 96. So, yeah, there, there are some, if I made some uh, better stock choices, but. But you know, the thing is about technology is that we don't know what the sure things are. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, a lot of us thought Commodore was the thing, and why, why yeah. would anybody suspect that Commodore would not be successful? It had the best-selling computer. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that has always stuck with me with Commodore, especially the Amiga, is the sense of what might have been if Commodore had survived through the 90s, which was a hard thing considering that Apple barely made it. Uh, mm, yeah. mm. So, so yes, uh, computers have been a part of my life since that first C64. Yes? In the book, how, how old is Laura in uh, 2016? Laura 55, was, 60? Yeah, to, no, she was... Uh, What's interesting is Laura's character is is actually my age, so um, so yeah, she would be 55 in the story. So there's the difference between her as a 25 year old, yeah. sort of like me. I was uh, I, you know, her character graduated in. Uh, 1985, and I with a bat with a master's. I graduated from Northridge in '85, so there was um, so I drew parallels. <laughs> yes, you're doing a great job, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Laura, is she based on any of the women that you worked with in the tech industry in the '80s? 
Uh, no, she's not based on, and none of the characters in the books are based on any specific people. I, I, I've tried, I'm not a, I don't, Romana clefs don't work very well for me, so. But um, a lot of the things that Laura experienced were experienced by people in the tech industry. You know, how it was very difficult for women to break into tech. And although, and even today, I think in a lot of areas of tech, men outnumber women in life, especially with. Now, where I work today, we actually do a really good job where we have a really good balance of women in management in various positions and actually technology. But I know that's something that has always been a challenge and we always want to encourage more women to get involved in STEM and in technology because they contribute a lot. Okay. Is there anything else? Thank you, Matthew. Well, thank you again. And again, if you want to buy the books, we're over here at the table. We take cash. We, te we take credit cards, too. Ooh. So, Yay. so <laughs> thanks again, and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank, thank you. you. Woo, good night. Yay. <laughs> the Commodore Los Angeles Super Show.